Okay, we've just said that understanding these electron transitions as they hop from different energy levels can be used to characterize materials. What on earth am I talking about? It's something that's called EDS, EDX, or EDAX, EDAX. Those are all referring to the same thing. It's pretty amazing. So here's how it works. Um, this is a tool inside of a microscope. So you could take a material, right? This pen, the glass that this is made of. You could put that, anything you want, inside the microscope. And then you're going to do EDS, and it will tell you what elements are present. How on earth does it do that? So the way it does that is it takes your atom, right? Let's say you've got this atom here made up of different electron shells, okay? So you've got your positively charged nucleus down here, and then you've got your shell 1, your shell 2, and your shell 3 over here. So your, what your substance that you're trying to investigate is made up of these different materials. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to disrupt it in order to cause electrons to shift and start to change energy levels. So the way that you disrupt it is you bombard it with something with really high energy. So in comes some really high energy wavelength, right? It comes into this thing, and the electron that used to be living right here, for example, it might absorb that light and then go flying out, okay? So you've knocked it out of position. Imagine you took like a gun and you just shot that thing out of position. So now instead of being an electron there, you have an empty spot. That square represents an empty box, okay? We'll color it, color it green. This empty box is now open for business. An electron that wanted to could fill this spot. So the question is, do electrons want to fill that spot? Well, think about the last time you went to a concert, right? If it's a band that you really liked, and then somebody from the front row gets up and leaves because they got to go to the bathroom or something or leave early, does that empty little vacancy just stay put? No, no way. It's going to get filled in by people further behind that want to get a little bit closer. It's the exact same thing with our electrons. Remember, this is positively charged in the middle here, right? That's positively charged nucleus. If it's positively charged, we'll just put a big positive sign in the middle, then all of these other electrons out here that are further out in these other orbitals, they want to get closer to that positive charge. So if this guy right here drops down and fills that empty spot, then he has gotten closer, a negative has gotten closer to a positive, and therefore that went down in terms of energy. In this universe, everything happens because it lowers its energy. The before state was higher in energy, and then you knocked that thing out, and then it had a chance to come down lower, so it lowered its energy. Okay, And as it does so, the only way that it can do that, since it went from high energy to low energy, what do we know about creating or destroying energy in the universe? Is it allowed? No, that's not allowed. We don't destroy or create energy in the universe. We just transform it from one form to another. So if it started at a high energy level and it ended at a lower energy level, what it must do is it must give off a wavelength of light. It must give off radiation equal to that difference in energy, right? So this has some lambda equal to this difference in energy, right? So that's going to be proportional to E1 minus E2, whatever these, or E2 minus E1, these two different energy levels. Make sense? So that's if it goes from 2 to 1. But another scenario would be that this guy dropped down and filled it. And he gave off a different energy, right? I'm drawing those wavelengths different because it would be different. It's a bigger difference, so it's going to be a shorter wavelength, okay? This makes sense? So in, when you take these, you put them in this tool, an EDS you know, system. You bombard it with high energy electrons. That knocks out some of the more inner electrons. Your outer electrons start to fall in. And you start to observe this, right? By you just put a detector over here. You have an eyeball, right? So you have you have an, an electronic detector over here that can detect these things. So it sees them and measures what their energy was. So that's what you see over here. This it says here EDS analysis of some area on your sample. And if you look at this, we're going to zoom in. It's measured as a function of of wavelength down here. So that's forgive me that that's really small, but this is your wavelength. And then you have counts on this axis, so how much of different things. So at some specific wavelength, you see these are like spikes. At that wavelength, you have something corresponding to, I can't read that, you know, some element. Whereas over here, you've got a spike that corresponds to carbon or oxygen or magnesium, right? So this is so cool. You bombard your sample, up generates the spectra, and because we know that specific elements have very unique characteristic um, 
energy differences. Remember, we know that because of our Rydberg formula up here, right? Each element has very specific transitions that are possible. None of these things are exactly equal. They're all pretty unique. We end up with unique peaks like this. And then the bigger the peak means the more of that element there was. So you can actually be quantitative. Think how cool this is. All of a sudden, I can put, let's say iPhone comes out with some fancy new um, material. In there. Let's say they're using some new glass. And it's not corning glass, right? So you could figure out what this glass is made of by putting it in there, and it's going to generate a spectra like this, which, and it's going to say that it's got boron, it's going to say it's got oxygen and silicon, and it'll tell you how much of those different elements there are. It says 10% of this element, 20% of this element, 40% of this, and you know the remainder is some other element. So this is a really powerful tool because it can generate this, right? Here's the elements that are present. You got it by analyzing these different lines. Those represent maybe like 2 to 1 or 1 to 2. I can't remember what the K series was. And here it is, the atomic percent. 35% of the atoms must have been silicon. 20% must have been magnesium. 43 must have been oxygen. And you can convert those to a weight percent. Think how powerful this would be if you worked at a company that was trying to reverse engineer your competitor's product. Very powerful. So this is energy dispersive spectroscopy, EDS, or sometimes called EDX or EDAX. Okay? So let's do another example of this. Let's say that I've got a green laser pointer, right? A green laser pointer. Um, the color of green is, let's say it's 525 nanometers. So each one of those photons of light coming out of my green laser pointer, how much energy does it have? We're going to go back to this equation. E equals HC over lambda. Okay, This time we know the wavelength, that's this guy, and we're being asked to solve for the energy. Great, we can do that. So we're going to say that that's equal to 1239 electron volt nanometers divided by 525 nanometers. The nanometers cancel and we're left with just electron volts, which is good because that's what we want. And uh, let's go ahead and plug that in. So 1239 divided by 525. 1239 divided by 525 is 2.36. So each one of those photons carries 2.36 electron volts of energy. So if you ever heard that like green laser pointers are more dangerous than lead, red laser pointers to point in your eye, that depends on two things. One is the energy per photon. Green is just a higher energy than red. But also it might be just more intense. There could be more of those photons and that could be more damaging. So if you've ever heard like a... Um, They'll do it in milliwatts, like a 50 milliwatt versus a 100 milliwatt laser is telling you how many of these photons there are by multiplying, you know, how many of them uh, on per, per period of time. That goes from energy to power. So that is how you can use these transitions as an engineer. We'll do some examples of this later in the semester where we're going to reverse engineer some different materials by looking at their EDS spectra, which is pretty cool.